Thank you very much for the invitation for this presentation. Today, actually, I'm going to talk about extracellular polymeric substances from cyanobacteria. So I will not talk a lot about the synthetic biology, but we can discuss that another time. <laughs> So to start with, everyone knows our favorite pets, the cyanobacteria, and they are photosynthetic, prokaryotes, some can fix nitrogen. They have simple nutrition requirements, which make them very easy to cultivate and not so expensive to do so. And they have a morphological diversity that goes from unicellular to colonial filamentous cells, and they have also cellular differentiation. As everyone knows also, they are responsible for the introduction of oxygen into the atmosphere, which make them very prominent in terms of evolution. And most of the cyanobacteria strains can produce extracellular polymeric substances. These substances are mainly heteropolysaccharides, and they can remain attached to the cell as sheets, capsules, or slimes, or as here you can see, they can be released to the culture medium and then they are called RPSs for released polysaccharides. They have different functions depending on the strain and the environment. They mainly protect the cells against uh, UV, desiccation, etc. They can also be a form of sequestering nutrients and they are pivotal on biofilm formation. The cyanobacterial EPSs, they are considerably different from the bacterial counterparts because they have up to 13 different monosaccharides, which give them a structural complexity that you don't see on the EPSs from algae or from uh, other bacteria. They may contain one or two uronic acids and sulfate groups, which gives them a strong anionic character. And they also contain deoxyexoses and peptides. Altogether, this makes the cyanobacterial EPSs very good for certain applications. They have high potential for biotechnological and biomedical applications. I will give some examples later on, but they can be vehicles for drug delivery. They can be quite good biomaterials for tissue engineering, for bioremediation, etc. But then you would like to produce these EPSs in certain amounts, and we should also would like to tailor the CPSs for a given function. And for that, we need to know their biosynthetic pathways. What do you know about bacterial EPS production? We know that the EPS production is, of course, linked to the central carbon metabolism, and it starts in the cytoplasm with the monosaccharide activation into sugar nucleotides, and then these sugar nucleotides will go via glycosyl transferases to the cell envelope where the EPSs are assembled and exported. In bacteria, this is done via three different pathways, the WCY dependent, the ABC transporter, or the synthase dependent pathway. When we start to look into the cyanobacteria, we used all the genome available at the time. It was more than 100 genomes, and uh, Sara Pereira did the film-wide analysis of the cyanobacterial genomes. And what we could see was that most of the cyanobacteria harbor genes related to the three pathways, but often not a complete set defining each pathway. So that means they have homologs from this pathway, this pathway, and this pathway, but often not the complete set. So that makes us think that cyanobacterial EPS production do not follow one of the pathways that was probably cross-talk or an even more complex scenario. And to complicate a little bit more this picture, we also look into the Synecocystis genome, and we could see that there are multiple gene copies. And the genes are not in operons, like they are often in bacteria, but they are scattered throughout the genome. Then we and others, not only us, started by the classical pathways generating knockout mutants. The first knockout mutants that we generate had no phenotype. So I'm talking about this one's here, and we couldn't see any phenotype in terms of EPSs. But let's see the glass are full. We have our methodology good to characterize these mutants, and we could put up good workflow to assess these mutants. And then suddenly we end up with two mutants, this WZC and WZB mutants, where they show differences in terms of EPSs compared to the synecocystis wild type. 
and the WCC knockout mutant produced less capsular polysaccharides and less RPSs, while the WZB produces the same amount of CPSs but kept the difference on the RPSs. And that led us immediately to think that the capsular production and the release polysaccharides are at least diversion processes. I will come back to this truncate mutant later on. But then when we did the double mutant, WZC and WZB, we had less capsular polysaccharides, but we had more RPSs. So when we delete both genes, we end up with more RPSs. And that let us think that probably the RPS production was diverted to another route. Here we are talking about the, the WZY dependent pathway. Maybe it went through the ABC transporter pathway. We went to look into these proteins more in detail, and we could confirm that, as suggested previously, the WZB adds phosphatase activity, and it has the structure very similar to low molecular weight phosphatases, but not similar to the prokaryotic ones. It was more similar to the amoeba ones, so more similar to the eukaryotic phosphatases. Talking about WZC, WZC has ATPase activity and has the capacity to autophosphorylate itself. The, this WZC protein has a tyrosine-rich tail and it has the capacity to autophosphorylation. What we could say from this work was that WZC and WZB play a role in EPS production, affecting both the amount of EPS is produced and the composition. I didn't talk about here about the composition, but was slightly different. Was not different in terms of monosaccharides, but in the amount of each monosaccharide. And that WZC is a substrate for WZB, at least in vitro. Sara Pereira now is working hard to prove this is also happens in vivo. So we are continuing this work, characterizing these proteins. And because we thought maybe there is a, a more important route for the production of EPSs in cyanobacteria, we also generate a mutant on the PPSM, which is on the ABC transport and dependent pathway in bacteria. And I'm talking about ABC transport, WCY dependent, but in, in cyano, in the end, we might call it something different when we understand all these pathways. And these mutants show greater impact on the RPSs. It produces 50% less RPSs. Surprising for us, the total carbohydrate amount was similar to the wild type. And then this led us to wonder if this mutant uh, stores the excess of carbon intracellularly. Of course, the first thought that we have was, well, it accumulates for sure more glycogen, but it does not. The amount of glycogen is a non-significant difference, but it accumulates more polyhydroxybutyrate. So the roots are deviated towards the production of more PHP in the KPSM mutant. This mutant also show other uh, characteristics or phenotype, as you want to call it. It clamps. When you have low cell density, you can see here, it's more sensitive to light than the wild type but then it loses this phenotype when you have higher cell densities. In terms of the carotenoids, the secreted carotenoids, the KPSM has less carotenoids in the extracellular media compared to the wild type. You can see the orange color of the medium of the wild type, and you can see here the pale orange from the mutant. We went also to look into the exoproteome, and what you see marked here is first, the, the mutant secretes more proteins than the wild type, and this band here is shifted, and this band is the PLA. So we could also show that this is difference on the glycosylation of the PLA component. By looking into the transcriptome and to the proteome of the mutant versus the wild type, we could see also a lot of alterations in the sugar metabolism. So we can say that the absence of TPSM, this uh, protein membrane, has a pleiotropic effect in synecocystis, not only on the APS production. Just a quick summary. In the mutant, we have less RPSs, we have more secreted proteins, we have less carotenoids that are secreted, and we have an accumulation of polyhydroxybutyrate. So the disruption of this uh, EPS production and export impacts all the cell homeostasis and carbon fluxes.
And as I said in the beginning, these genes show up in multiple copies in the genome of Synecocystis. So we wanted to do a triple mutant, so deleted the three copies of TTSM that exist in the genome of Synecocystis. And to do so, we didn't do a normal triple mutant. Marina went to the lab of uh, Polatsen and KTH in Sweden, in Stockholm, and uh, make use of the CRISPR-I technology to, to do so. And uh, this CRISPR-I uses a single RNA and a dead Cas9 to inhibit the transcription. The 3CG RNA KTSM mutants repress 60%, 70%, and 80%. This was evaluated by RT-PCR, so we can say they were successively repressed, although it was not 90 or 100% repressed. And the phenotype of this mutant was very similar to the single mutant. As you can see, it has less 20% of capsular polysaccharides and less 40% of RPSs. So we can say that this ORF, the SLR0977, is the key PSM homologue involved in the RPS export in Synecocystis. And uh, I put here at least 100 conditions tested because we can see expression of this gene, but under very specific stress conditions, if you look into the paper of COPF. We can see expression in the low temperatures or nitrate depletion, but normally this seems to be the key PSM homologue that is involved in the RPS export in Synecocystis. The, the other genes seem to be more redundant. We are also doing many other multiple copy mutants, but this is an ongoing work and we don't have yet the results to show. What we are using also now is an inducible CRISPR-I system, so we can tune a bit the regulation and not to delete all the three copies, but delete one and then leave the other one on and then see the results for that. Talking still about mutants, we also looked into another mutant that was uh, generated in the group of Martin Adman, and that was Synecocystis delta CGF mutant, so in a sigma-3 factor, because we could see that this mutant had an altered EPS secretion, and this time was not a decrease on EPSs, was an increase on EPSs. So when you delete the CGF, you have four times more RPSs than normally. This mutant also had a clumping phenotype, so it uh, sedimentated very easily and it reduced a lot of RPSs, so that make our life easier to isolate these RPSs. And these RPSs were a bit different because they have a high content in sulfate, about 12%, and uh, a lot of peptides as well, comprising about 28%. And because we could see in the literature that this kind of polymers with a lot of sulfate could have anti-tumor activity, and we are in an institute that does mainly research on health, we went to test this polymer against three human tumor cell lines, thyroid carcinome, malignant melanome, and ovarian carcinome. And we were very happy to see that this polymer, in fact, has anti-tumor activity. So, and the delta CGF polymer has a stronger activity compared to the wild-type polymer, but they both work as anti-tumor agents. And we can see that the polymer decreased the cell's viability in a time and dose-dependent manner. And uh, the way that does so is uh, increasing the levels of apoptosis via P53 and caspase 3 activation. What were the features of the polymer responsible for this anti-tumor activity? So we try to obtain uh, fractions with lower molecular weight, and we also try to modify the peptide content of the polymer. And by the results obtained, we could see that the high molecular weight fractions are very important for the polymer bioactivity. So when we start to chop up the polymer, the anti-tumor activity is reduced. And if you clean the peptide content, not totally because we reduced peptide content only about 40%, the polymer has stronger anti-tumor activity. It doesn't mean that the peptides there don't have an action, but uh, at least the removed ones, that the ones that are loosely attached to the polymer, don't contribute to the anti-tumor activity and maybe even contribute to make the other groups that are important less exposed. 
we also tried to play a bit with the sulfur content and we were very surprised to see that didn't change the polymer anti-tumor activities. So what is described in the literature for other polymers doesn't work here. And then we went to read the literature carefully and this is an assumption, it's not really proved. So it was like a myth about the sulfur content of the polymers. Here we are now moving to in vivo assays. And for that, we are using uh, the cheek embryo cordial antoic membrane. And we are using our cell lines to make tumors on the membrane. And then we are treating these tumors with our polymer, both with the polymer with less peptides, as well as the original polymer. By now, I don't have yet results, but I will have results on this very soon. We are working with another polymer and is the polymer from cyanotesi. And cyanotesi is also a unicellular cyanobacteria, is a marine cyanobacteria and is a highly efficient EPS producer. Most of cyanotesi are efficient EPS producers. The only thing is we don't have the tools to modify it genetically, but we work also with this polymer. And the results that I'm going to show now is about the cyanotesi polymer. This uh, polymer is uh, very well characterized. First of all, the cyanotice is a very efficient producer. It produces about two grams of polymer per gram of dry weight. This is a lot of polymer, so it makes it very easy to isolate this polymer. We have characterized this polymer. It has nine different monosaccharides, two uronic acids, the glucuronic and galacturonic acid. It has about 4% of peptides and 10% of sulfate groups. Most of it is composed of high molecular weight fractions. It's very thermostable. If you see here the temperatures, they go until 800 degrees and it's a very, very thermostable polymer. And it has a very complex chemical structure. We didn't solve the structure yet, but we are trying to do so in the collaboration with the University of Aveiro and uh, Roberto de Filippi is in Florence is helping us with the monosaccharide decomposition. This polymer we use to um, control drug delivery as a vehicle for controlled drug delivery. And when we did the, this uh, first assays, we could see that uh, it's not uh, a good vehicle for small molecules, the polymer, because the matrix has very big pores. But it's spontaneous assemblies with functional proteins, for instance, with lysozyme. And then uh, the proteins are released via swelling of the polymer protein matrix. So it's quite easy to do this. And we could modulate this kinetic of releasing the functional proteins by using divalent cations like calcium chloride. We could also test it against human fibroblasts and we could see that it's non-toxic. So this is a promising vehicle for the topical administration of therapeutic molecules. And as I told you, it was not good for small molecules alone, but if you mix the polymer with other things or make some formulations, for instance, with Arabicam, we could also use it for the control deliver of vitamin B12. So hopefully we will see this in the market sometime. We have also patents on these uses. We also try in collaboration here with the bioengineers that we have here at our institute we use these polymers for coatings. And why did we talk about these coatings? Because as you probably know, there is a big problem worldwide with the biofilm formation on medical devices, for instance, on catheters. And this causes a lot of unnecessary time in hospitals and deaths even. And what uh, people, everyone would like to do is to prevent this biofilm form formation on catheters. Also because uh, now this is treated with a lot of antibiotics and this causes resistance on bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. So we use gold substrates and uh, via a linker, a universal glue that is PDA, we could uh, put thin coat of RPSs. And then we compared our RPS coating with uh, the normal material of catheters, which is polyurethane. And we could see that our cyano coating had a smooth topography, it was a thin coating and they have uh, highly hydrophobic properties with a mild negative charge. So that was already good to start with. 
And then we start our bacterial addition assays and we use common pathogens. All these pathogens uh, came from the hospital nearby. And we could see that when you have the cyanocoating, the addition of this bacteria to the surface was reduced by 80 to 96% reduction. If you look here at the E. coli, is really, really remarkable, the addition. And the coating does so just because of its anti-adhesive properties. It has no antimicrobial activity. It's just anti-adhesive, basically. We also have a patent pending on this. And we thought also if this could be used on blood contacting devices. And trying to look into this, we tested the platelet adhesion and activation. And we could see that the cyanocosting reduced platelet adhesion by approximately 87% and did not activate the platelets. So it's broad spectrum, this coating. But because of uh, some of the medical doctors that we have here in the building as well, we are particularly interested in the urinary catheters. So we decided to do, redo our uh, microbial addition assays using artificial urine and uropathogens. And by uropathogens, I mean E. coli, Staphylococcus aureus, the antibiotic resistant one, and also the fungi, Candida albicans. And as you can see, we also had very good results with these three uropathogens. We also looked into the encrustation because, as you know, a lot of times the urinary catheters become blocked by crystals and they need to be changed. So we could see that the cyanocoating also prevents the encrustation of large crystals. So it could be an effective and antibiotic-free solution to fight catheter-associated urinary tract infections. As I showed you before, we did this using a gold substrate, which is the model material, but then we wanted to put our coating onto polyurethane, which is the normal material of catheters. And to do so, we tested uh, several treatments and ozone activation. We could make a very thin coat of the RPSs, and that thin coat also prevented uh, the biofilm formation, even in the presence of artificial urine. Uh, nowadays, and because this was all done in 2D materials, was not done on catheters, we are working together with Hydromedical, which is a company that produces catheters, and they are studying novel solutions to apply this coating directly onto catheters. We are also testing this in, in pigs and we will have some results soon. I'm not sure I can show all the details of these results because we, of course, have patent spending and the companies don't want us to show all the results, but I can give you a hint of it. Also, together with the Faculty of Medicine here in Porto, we try to use this uh, polymer as a wound healing agent. They are particularly concerned uh, on diabetic foot wound, so we use the, the polymer as a wound healing agent. What we could see is not so promising, but uh, what we could see is the, the polymer does not influence cell viability, so is neutral for human cells, for human fibroblasts and endothelial cells. And when we do the injury assay, we can see that uh, cyanoflan did not affect the mobility or the migratory capacity of fibroblasts or endothelial cells, but doesn't promote also that mobility and we would like it to be increased. What we could see, and that was good, that uh, as an antioxidant effect, which is also good, and we could also see that we can uh, have more scar tissue and uh, less inflammatory cells. So if you want to use it as a wound healing agent, what we can do is to add some things to the polymer, for instance, growth factors or antimicrobial agents to increase the capacity of regenerating the skin. But by itself, it doesn't seem to be a fantastic wound healing agent. And this is uh, our group here in Porto. As I said, we have many other projects. Some of them might be interesting for you. We are uh, creating a lot of novel tools for synthetic biology. We are making use of these tools to produce interesting compounds. For instance, at the moment, we were able to hydroxylate testosterone using synecosis cells. 
And we are using our promoters and our plasmids to integrate this into genome of Synecosysts. And thank you very much. And I'm open to questions.